I just have to begin by saying this. Over these last few days, I have so looked forward to sharing what I'm going to share with you. You know, God is the living God. Those are not just fancy words. That is an amazing reality. The God of the Bible is the God of today. The God who revealed himself to his children in the New Testament era is the God who is still doing that in our age. The God who answered prayer of those who cried out to him from the children of Israel is the God who continues to answer the prayers of his children. And the God who guided the early believers as they carried out the mission of winning the nations to Jesus the Messiah The God who gave direction by his Holy Spirit told them where to go, when to go, and what to say is the same God today. And he is the one whom we worship because he is real, he is near, he loves us unconditionally and offers us hope and forgiveness and life in Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the nations, the hope of Israel, and the hope of the world. This morning, he has some amazing things to share with us, and I eagerly look forward to telling you about that, okay? But first, let's pray. Would you join me, please? Father, we praise you because you are so good. You are so near. You know us by name. You've counted, Lord Jesus, you said, the Father has counted the very hairs on our heads. You know our deepest needs. You know our sorrows and our hurts. You know our weaknesses and our failings. And you love us anyway. And you invite us to yourself. And you offer forgiveness and healing and hope and transformation by the power of the shed blood of Jesus, by the power of his resurrection from the grave, by the outpouring of your Holy Spirit and by the assurance that he is coming back and soon. And so today, Lord, we pray that you would speak in a mighty way into each one of our hearts and minds and spirits. We pray that you would draw us to yourself. We pray that you would reveal your truth and change us from the inside out by the power of the living Jesus. Amen. Just a word to refresh your memories, first of all. Do you remember a number of weeks ago, nine weeks ago, when we started this series on, on the fruit of the Holy Spirit? We'd shared with you the fact that God had given a prophetic word through one of our staff, and the word went something like this. Tell Chris... This is the next sermon series. And then we received these unusual words, agape, cara, erene, tolerant, cheetos, good works, pistols, potatoes, and egg grates. And I, if you will recall, I'd mentioned to you that when Pastor Phil saw that email, he immediately knew what it was referring to. It was referring to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Today we come to egg crates. In Greek, enkrateia, self-control. And there is so much here that God desires to share with us. I know self-control can be scary, but I believe when I share the rest of this story, you are going to be blessed and the fears will be removed and in its place, will come hope and healing and life and forgiveness and assurance in the Lord Jesus. So here's the story. Last week, during various days throughout the week, I spent time looking up all of the times self-control is used in the New Testament. There are two different words, enkrateia and sophron. Enkrateia is the word that Paul uses here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. The fruit of the Spirit is 
self-control. And as I studied those words throughout the scripture, the Lord opened up many avenues, and I found myself as God continued to reveal truth, thanking him for the amazing things that he was doing, not just in those past days, but over the past couple of weeks in particular. And uh, on Thursday morning, while I was trying to put the message together, I found myself in prayer saying, Lord, you have shown me so much here in the scriptures. Would you please show me a way to share this with my dear friends and brothers and sisters that will especially touch our hearts in this whole area of self-control? As I was praying that, I, I was also taking a look at my email. Normally, I don't look at my emails on Thursdays when I'm putting together my message. I want to be totally focused. But I had asked one of our team, Anne, if she would please do some research for me and get some information that I'll be sharing with you later on. And she responded back by saying she would have that for me and email it to me that morning. It was now late in the morning. It was getting close to noon. And so I decided to go to the email and see if Anne had, I knew she would because she always keeps her word, if she had emailed what she had promised. And it wasn't there. And as a result, I looked at that and thought, well, okay, I'm sure it'll come. There must be something holding off. And I was just getting ready to close on. I thought, you know, I'm just going to quick delete all, I don't know about you, but I get all sorts of email. I mean, stuff that comes from you guys and people I know, that's wonderful. But you, know, you get a lot of advertisements and other things. And I, I'm just going through delete, 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 delete. Until I came to this one email. And I was getting ready to swipe my finger across the iPad and delete it, and the Holy Spirit said, don't delete that until you read it. And so I opened it up, and I wept. Because what I was reading, something I don't ever remember reading before, was a direct answer to the prayer. Lord, Show me how to share with people I love the mighty work you desire to do. Here is what I read. It is a true story. It's been classified top secret for over 40 years. It is the story of a Russian, a Soviet submarine, Foxtrot class submarine B-59, sent out into the Arctic, and then given new orders from Moscow to head south, to head down to the Caribbean, specifically to the coast of Florida. The sub headed down and got caught in a hurricane. Sailors were sick, systems were on the fritz, but it plodded on. The Foxtrot-class submarine was intended primarily for northern waters. And so when it got into the Caribbean, not only was the air conditioning not working well, but the ship was really not equipped for what it was experiencing. And it was at that point that the captain took her deep so they would not be spotted by an American flotilla. One aircraft carrier, USS Randolph, and 11 destroyers. The date, 27 October, 1962. The height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The sub went deep. The American ships began pinging. They held them down. The crew was hot. Temperatures on board that Foxtrot class sub rose to between 120 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Sailors were passing out. Systems were breaking down. The captain was furious. And then it happened. The American ships began firing off small charges. A sign basically, come to the surface or else. The Soviet captain heard the sound of those charges and assumed that he was being depth charged. 
And at that point, having been through the ringer with so much suffering and disaster on the ship, uncertainty, they had not been able to hear from Moscow for days. They thought that perhaps World War III had already begun and they were carrying what was known as a special weapon. That's a euphemism for nuclear torpedo. In the midst of all of this, the captain gave the order, fire the weapon. On a normal Soviet submarine, all it took was the order of a captain and the political officer. But B-59 was different. There was a third officer on board. He was the flotilla commander, 36 years old. His name, Vasily Arkhipov. Vasily Arkhipov pulled the captain aside, said, we can't do this. And the captain said, we are going to go down in honor. He was ready to fire a nuclear torpedo that would have vaporized an American aircraft carrier and its destroyer screen. It would have ushered in, in all likelihood, World War III. And Vasily Arkhipov, who just happened to be on that one sub of four in the flotilla, said, no, we will not do this. And he persuaded the captain to countermand the order to surface. And the Foxtrot submarine B-59 surfaced in the midst of the American flotilla. This has been classified for over 40 years. But Vasily Arkhipov probably saved the world as we know it. He would later die from cancer that was brought on by exposure to nuclear radiation on another sub he had served on. He would not live to see his name brought before the world. His wife described him as a humble man, quiet and controlled. And that, dear friends, is the power of self control. And you and I are alive today because of the self-control of a Soviet sailor named Vasily Arkhipov. So after I read that and fact-checked it, ended up adding a few things for your, the benefit of those of you who are into naval hardware, I contacted Anne. I said, I have a question I need to ask you. There's no judgment in this, but was there a reason you didn't send me the email when you said you would this morning? And her response was, God told me I couldn't send it yet. And I said, here's why. You see, the Lord is into the details of our lives. He is not a distant God. He is not one that we just sort of hope really does exist. He is near to all who call upon him. And he gives direction to his children. And he speaks into our hearts and lives. And he offers new life through faith in his son, in whom there is forgiveness and joy and peace. And when we talk about self-control, we have to look to him. After researching the story of Vasily Arkhipov, the Lord in a very interesting way told me the following. He basically said, go to Proverbs 16, verse 32. I did. And here's what I read. Would you read it with me? Better a patient person than a warrior one with self-control than one who takes a city. Hallelujah is right. He is a good 
and merciful and gracious God. I don't know about you, but when I hear the term self-control, one of the first things that comes to my mind is, oh, I blew it there, I messed up here, and what about this particular part in my life? You ever been there? You think, oh man, I just messed up my diet, I don't want to hear about self-control. Or I lost my temper with my kid, and I, man, self-control, oh, I could really use that, and I feel so ashamed. God's desire is not to shame you or me. God's desire is to bless and strengthen and renew us. About 30 years ago, I read something like this. I've kind of updated it into modern English. The beginning of self-control is to be controlled by Jesus Christ and to yield to his lordship. Those words have stuck with me because they are true and timeless. The beginning of self-control. Self-control is not something that you and I gin up from within. Self-control is not something that we kind of ratchet up on our own. Self-control in the true sense, the biblical sense, begins when we relinquish control and yield to the Lord Jesus Christ, allowing him to control us, yielding to his lordship. He is our savior. He's also our Lord. And his desire, his desire is to take you and me and to use us in ways that people may never know in this life, but will be known in the life to come. I had never heard of Vasily Arkhipov before. And Vasily Arkhipov never lived to learn that others knew what he had done. In reality, from what we're able to tell from the released Soviet archives, he got in a lot of trouble for what he had done. But God is at work in the hearts and lives of everyone who comes to the Lord Jesus and yields control to him. And that's where self-control has to start. You see, God does not desire to uh, run you through a, uh, a rough time just to beat up on you. That is not the way he works. He desires, because he loves us, to mold and shape us in the very image of our Savior. Now, the enemy, he's got other plans. <laughs> and, and this is so true. You look at the enemy's tactics. They, they are very clear. Usually what the devil tries to do is attack us on one of two fronts when it comes to the area of self-control. I'm going to put it right up there on the screen. He's going to either tempt us to boast about our control, our self-control. Boy, have you noticed how self-controlled I am? I'm really doing well compared to old so-and-so, you know. Or to drive us to despair and say, I've blown it so many times. I, I'm, I must be a horrible Christian because I'm wrestling with this and I've wrestled with it for years. The enemy loves to just dig his claws into us. And what God desires to do is to declaw him and renew us. When I look at the scriptures here, Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. I see God saying His Holy Spirit is the one who produces this. This is not something we do in our own power. Don't get me wrong, we are to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. We are saved purely by grace. We don't cooperate in anything other than receive what God pours out by faith. But when it comes to our Christian walk, we are to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, but we also recognize the power comes from Him. Self-control, enkrateia, the word that the apostle uses here in Galatians 5.23. If you're into biblical trivia, that word enkrateia is used in three other places in the New Testament. But there's another word that is used repeatedly in the New Testament that also means self-control. 
Enkrateia speaks especially, as Paul describes it here, about the inner strength that enables us to control our appetites. The other word is sophron, and it speaks about sober, sound judgment. In fact, Paul, writing to Timothy and to Titus, talks about leaders needing to, pref- to possess self-control, sound judgment that God gives. And not only leaders, but he says older men, you need to strive for self-control. And then he says, and by the way, older women, you need to teach the younger women about self-control. And he says, while we're on the subject, you young men, you need self-control. God is not saying, get self-control in your own strength. He's saying, I offer it through my Holy Spirit. And I desire to pour it out into your life. And rather than letting the enemy drive you to despair, or the enemy drive you into being an arrogant and pompous pain in the, yeah, God says, follow me, follow me, and watch what I will do in you. He is a good and gracious God. And that is why when the scriptures say, and I quote once again, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It says against such things, There is no law. You don't need to legislate to make self-control happen. You don't need to legislate to keep too much self-control from breaking out. Instead, what God says is, let me take control in your life and watch what I can do. And so it comes back to that phrase that I first read 30 years ago. Self-control begins. The beginning of self-control is to be controlled by Jesus Christ and to yield to his lordship. You know, here's the way the apostle Paul expresses it. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. In fact, we're going to put it up here. I'd like you to, would you read it with me? For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. The word translated self-discipline is the same root word that is often translated self-control, just as Pastor Phil mentioned earlier. God is the one who by his Holy Spirit enables us to exercise self-control. We're living in a day and age where that is so important. It is important, first of all, in a culture that is collapsing morally to exercise self-control, to not buy into the lies of the day that says, do whatever makes you feel good because if it makes you feel good, it must be good. And as long as you didn't hurt somebody or at least not somebody close by, it's just fine. And God is saying, I have a higher purpose for you and my desire is to use you in a mighty and profound way.